Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. In today's session of Akoya Academy, we're going to review the Codex Multiplex Analysis Viewer, and we're going to do a deep dive of a 36-plex breast cancer tissue. My name is Grady Carlson, and today I'll be helping you with your spatial analysis. I wanted to start this presentation by thank you for spatially distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to begin today with a brief review of the data and the imagery. I'll then explain how we can utilize unsupervised clustering for population identification and TISNI plots that will enable us to view populations and identify them within the image. We'll then wrap up taking a few questions. So our data set today is a breast cancer's tissue stained with 36 different markers. And we'll see that these markers are broadly characterized as structural, functional, or markers that indicate cell status. In this image, we're seeing markers like e adherin, vimentin, and collagen, which are structural. Similarly, we have CD31 and CD34, which are going to help us identify the structure of the vasculature. Other markers, like our immune markers, show functional components of our tissue, such as CD3 and CD8, showing our cytotoxic T cell. We're then going to show status markers, such as those that indicate proliferation or DNA repair, shown here. And finally, today we'll highlight a group of structural markers that allow us to typify our epithelial cells as luminal or basal inside the tissue. We're going to see how to use TISNI plots to identify populations within the tissue. We're also going to see how we can use both TISNI plots and clustering in order to conduct a high parameter analysis. Now, TISNI plots allow us to see biomarker expression in a graphical format where cells are organized in 2D space according to their similarity. We're able to use both clustering and TISNI plots to annotate, excuse me, to identify and annotate cells within the image. The biomarker, the range of biomarker expression that is, present in the image, such as keratin-14 shown here, where blue is low expression and red is high expression, is reflected within the TISNI plot, such that we can see low and high signals, understanding now that our keratin-14 positive cells are located within this little region here, for the most part. We can see all of our biomarkers expressed in biaxial gates and TISNI plots, which is shown uh, in this image an array of all of our TISNI plots and biomarkers intensities. If we focus on a few of the biomarkers, such as our keratins, we know that they're grouped together. Our basal markers are all located in one 2D location, and our luminal markers are in another. So we'll look for these areas to contain our luminal and basal populations, respectively. For those of you that watched our re recent webinar, today we're going to see how to use TISNI plots and clustering to identify uh, populations of cells, such as those that my colleague Oliver identified the other day as being keratin-8 and keratin-14 positive. And this cell population was rather rare and was identified using a combination of clustering and TISNI plots. So we're going to start our analysis today by going, going to Fiji. So I'm going to click Codex Mav to launch the software. And with the software, I'm going to go File, Open Experiment. I want to make sure I find this process folder. Say Open. Let's go to No Clustering. We're going to use clustering inside of MAV, which is why I can set this to no external clustering, just to clarify. Here we'll use the default segmentation provided by the processor, and I only have one process data set. If I had processed multiple runs, multiple runs would show up in the drop down menu with the most recent showing automatically. Okay, so MAV opens, and I now see that this black region is my image. And if I have multiple regions, I can go to File, Open Region 
to select the regions that I want to view. And those will appear here as individual tabs. All right, so for now, my first step is going to be to make sure this image J menu stays on top. So I'm gonna to go to edit options, appearance, and keep this image J window always on top. This way, as I'm working with Mav, I can keep all of my functionality. Now we're going to go through a few features here rather quickly because we have limited time today, uh, but I'll try and be as clear as possible. So we're going to use the magnifying tool to decrease the size of my region window while increasing the size of my uh, tools. So I'm going to right click to decrease the size. Automatically, this window with my tools scales to be larger. Now I can increase the size of my region while this region stays adequately large. Okay. Let's sort my markers by alphabetical order so I can start to work with them. Click display name to sort. We can add DAPI by selecting DAPI from the marker manager list. You'll note that DAPI did not appear in the image. It was only added to the markers list. We are able to interact with the markers, li <coughs> the markers list in order to visualize our markers. The scale bar here allows us to adjust the max and min scaling of the image. It does not modify the data in any way, shape, or form. It's just for your viewing preference. So we can view a few markers here. Expand the table to see all of our different markers. Okay, so right now we can see that we have much more keratin 5, 8, and 14 in the image than we do our immune markers like CD3 and CD8, yet still our immune markers are present. I can go ahead and turn my DAPI back on now that I've visualized uh, my markers of interest. Some of them, like CD3 and CD8, were rather rare, which it was nice to visualize those without DAPI at first. Again, I can change the scaling of my markers by modifying the min, min and max values uh, as I need to for our scaling preference. So my first step here today is going to be to gate my populations. And I'm going to gate on DAPI. So I'm just going to select those cells that are DAPI positive. So I'm actually going to scroll up to frequency. So I'm going to see the number of cells that, are, that meet a certain um, intensity criteria of DAPI. So that's what frequency is. It's the frequency of times we see cells with a certain uh, mean fluorescence intensity. So I'm going to use this line tool to draw my gate around the cell population I want to select as being DAPI positive. And I'm going to color it yellow. And I'm going to add it as a population in the image. So now I've selected DAPI positive cells. And now that I've selected my DAPI positive cells, I want to perform clustering to identify cell populations within this DAPI positive population. To do that, I'm going to select DAPI positive population by highlighting it. I'm then going to navigate to the analysis and X shift clustering tool. Deselect DAPI because I've already gated on it and I don't need it for clustering analysis. Okay, to see the clustering parameters or to get a more detailed description of them, um, please see another one of our resources or contact us at support at acoyobio.com. I'd be happy to explain to you what these different parameters mean. For now, we're going to stick with the default values and use selected populations in order to cluster within this DAPI positive population. We can see the progress bar up here is showing us that clustering is happening. Okay, and now clustering is finished, so I'm going to go ahead and and say to save my analysis. 
And now all of my clusters are placed into the clustering tab. And so I can view them here. I can hide cycle number by clicking cycle. And I can start to add the clusters as populations inside of the image by clicking the plus sign or add all. Add all adds all of my clusters. The plus sign adds one or more. And I'm able to add more by highlighting and clicking the add button as needed. Here I can calculate dendrograms for my rows and columns um, as I wish. The columns, I'll have to scroll down in order to uh, visualize that column dendrogram. Okay, so those are the tools inside of the clustering menu. Here we have the scaling tool that allows us to scale by cluster value instead of biomarker value against the entire data set. And um, last but not least, uh, we are going to want to go ahead and explain what this clustering uh, ID is up here. This is a timestamp with the date, so the year the date and then t the time, which allows you to identify when you run this clustering scan, uh, when you ran this clustering run, excuse me. Um, and it also tells us that it was angular clustering with a K value of 22. So now that we've delved into what this window describes in terms of our uh, clustered analysis, let's go ahead and, and add all these clusters as populations. Immediately my image turns, well my populations in my image turn gray, and that's because I clustered within the DAPI positive population, which is still selected. So if I want to visualize my population my populations, I need to uncheck the DAPI positive. Now if I zoom in, I can see that all of my different dots indicating cells of different populations have been colored according to uh, what type of population they are. Each, each color is an individual cluster. Now, I can use those dendrograms to color populations by similarity by clicking this paintbrush tool. So that's a super useful tool that allows me to see that, well, all of these cells around this area are different than this area. And in this area, we have two types of cells, purple and blue, which compose the majority of it. There's also this little green population. And we'll see in this presentation how to go about identifying what these different populations are. In general, there will be four tools that we're going to use. We're going to use the image itself. We're going to use box plots. We're going to use Tisney plots. And we're going to use clustering. Now we can definitely also use biaxial gating. It's just that we won't have much time today to get into how to use biaxial gating to identify expression markers uh, such as maybe some of our DNA repair status markers or if we had them immune checkpoint markers. Okay, so uh, let's just quickly get into uh, our analysis here by first going to the Tisney plot. So we've done our clustering and we have identified uh, clustering populations. And I want to show you how we can identify uh, these populations within the Tisney plot. So let's go to gating and say new. I'll drop this down and say Tisney Y and Tisney X. And no, this isn't voice recognition. So if you say it, it won't happen. But if you click it, it should. So here we're coloring by density. And we can color uh, by population to see all those populations that we've clustered saying by population. OK, great. Now I can see two forms of high dimensional analysis. I can see that my Tisney plot provides one form of high dimensional analysis where each two dimensional region of the Tisney plot represents a distinct population of cells. I can also see that clustering has gone to work to identify cell populations as well. So it's two levels of high dimensional stratification consolidated into one simple graph. Um, I really like to use this. Okay, so in addition to being able to visualize my populations and make use of clustering, I can also visualize biomarkers. So I can see that CD3 is localized to this region and this region broadly where blue is very low expression and red is high expression. CD8, not surprisingly, is located in the same region where CD3 was. So this is likely my population of CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. Okay, CD31 is located here. So I'd expect that CD34 is also located in that region, again, because my populations are located in 2D space in this Tisney plot. And sure enough, if I click on CD34, we have a localization of high expression of CD34 signal there. Now, I accidentally just drew a gate there. I don't want to do that yet. So I'm going to delete that. 
Okay. So we can look at uh, some other markers like CD68, macrophages, and collagen, EK adherin, FOXP3, keratin 8. And as I'm clicking through these markers here, I'm noticing that many of my um, many of my markers that might indicate stromal components, for example here, such as vimentin, are located on this side of the graph. That is, we have red expression on this side, whereas this other side here is mostly um, tumor markers, or at least markers of epithelial cells. Maybe not tumor, but at least epithelial cells, such as keratin-18, generally. So what I'll do first is show you how to use this two-dimensional information and biomarker intensities to uh, make use of the TISNY plot and identify populations. So let's go ahead and draw a gate, a polygon, and let's just go ahead and separate these two regions. All right, region one of the gate. Or region one of the plot, rather. Okay, so I have uh, two gates, and forgive my drawing, I'm doing this rather quickly. So I've got two gates, one which I anticipate will have more stromal markers, and the other which I anticipate will have more tumor or epithelial markers based on my uh, biomarker expression profiles in my heat maps representing cells here in the plot. All right, so let's go ahead and make these red and green colors. So red would be stroma then, and green would be tumor if all my epithelial cells were tumor cells. And we can add these as populations. Now most everything is gray again that's been selected. Here a few cells aren't. That's likely because they were missed with my drawing somewhere in between here. Let's go ahead and uncheck all my clustered populations. We can sort by any of these column values. So I'll sort by name to get my uh, gated regions on top so I can easily choose them. They were colored by similarity, so they were assigned green and blue colors. Let's go back to coloring this one uh, red. And now I can see that my green is definitely uh, my epithelial cells, and I can see that most everywhere, that that's correct. And my red is pretty much stromal cells everywhere. So I think that um, that was a, a good illustration of how to use the 2D location of cells within the TISNY plot to stratify the population. Okay, so we're going to use this same uh, concept, except that now we're going to cut this down into smaller populations and try to parse out what the components of the tumor and the stroma are uh, here today. So this is an example of how to use the TISNY plot. We'll see that if I um, go ahead and turn all my populations back on, and go to populations and I have my all DAPI still turned on so let's go ahead and turn all DAPI off go back to gate now I can see them separate I would anticipate to have things split up quite a bit I expect this region to be its own population with maybe even a separate region down here I expect this purple region up here to be a population maybe one in here one up here and then one or two down here just by the 2D location of the cells within the TISNY plot and the fact that they've been clustered differently. Okay, so let's go ahead. We've seen TISNY plots now and we've applied our clustering. Let's go ahead and use the image in a box plot in addition to our uh, clustering and TISNY plot in order to identify populations. So I'm going to start by identifying, trying to identify uh, populations here uh, inside of the tissue. And first I want to identify whether or not I have uh, cell types relating to basal or luminal cells inside of the image. So one thing that I can do is I can sort by markers that indicate uh, basal or luminal cells. So let's go ahead and first visualize um, two things. 
one, our markers of interest inside of the image, and then two, uh, we'll sort these markers in the population table. So let's first get our markers visualized in the image. So CD3 and CD8 are great for cytotoxic T cells, but they're not gonna help us identify our different uh, epithelial cells in the image. So we can go ahead and reassign these colors. So I am going to first turn off all my populations so I have a clean slate to work with. TP63 is going to help me identify uh, my basal cell population in the image. It'll also let me show you, I want this to be yellow actually. I'm going to scale this view, changing the minimum value so I only see that nuclear staining that I'm interested in. Okay, now I'm going to go and uh, turn on keratin 14. Now keratin 14 is super bright and so I I'm going to need to diminish its its expression, its uh, presentation or scaling quite a bit, so that I can still resolve my TP63 in the image. Let's go ahead and uh, activate some other markers here, or, or turn them on. Okay, there's keratin eight. Keratin five. Keratin 17, again this one's bright, so it looks like it's in the basal region, not surprisingly. Keratin 18. Okay, and keratin 18 and keratin 8 are well overlapped, and I think I might have to leave keratin 19 to blue. Again, overlapped with 8 and 18. Okay, so we have identified um, our populations, uh, excuse me, we've identified our, uh, we visualized our markers rather, excuse me, inside of the image. And so now I can see there's many basal markers in most of this region of tissue and many luminal around here. So I'll look at the populations table and first I'm going to want to make sure that I don't see any gray. So I know that um, at least one of my tumor or stroma populations is checked and sure enough it is. Okay. And so um, now what I'm going to do is sort on markers that I know to be associated with a basal or luminal cell. So I'll look up here and look at all my markers and I'm noticing that perhaps I might have clicked uh, the marker manager to sort them by something else besides name, but I'm gonna sort them in alphabetical order. Okay, so now they're sorted in alphabetical order. And I'm going to go to TP63, for example, and look for markers that are positive for TP63. These should be my basal or myoepithelial cells. Sure enough, I also see expression of keratin 17, 14, and five uh, in a population of TP63 positive cells. So I would expect if I turn this on and off, there it is, that this is likely um, a basal population. So um, let's go ahead and find other markers that might, other populations. I want to understand what these blue and green populations are. So let's also sort by keratin 14. Okay, my blue population pops up. I see, that's this group here. Now, if we look, the expression of TP63 is quite different in this blue population compared uh, to the purple population. So that might be a big differentiator in terms of uh, telling these two clusters apart. Okay, it looks like these are um, two markers of interest that we can go forward with uh, immediately to try and parse apart whether or not um, they're different basal populations or uh, if they're not, if we can combine them. So let's go ahead and make a box plot to compare their intensities of different markers. So I'll go to box plot and I'll select, deselect all the populations only choosing those of interest. So five and 29. And I want to be able to, to be able to tell them apart, uh, um, excuse me, I want to be able to understand why clustering 
took them apart. So because I used all of my markers for clustering, I'm going to go ahead and put all of my markers for these two populations in the box plot. Okay, so looking at this uh, table here, I see one population in blue and one population in purple. I see blue has higher expression of keratin 19, purple has higher expression of vimentin, keratin 17 is about equal. Um, let's just keep going here. I'm, I'm looking at all these different markers. Blue has higher, ex higher expression of beta catenin. TFAM is higher expression in blue. SMA is higher in the uh, purple population, and TP63 is also higher in purple. And so I think from this um, plot, what I'm seeing is that the purple population is definitely, um, or, or very likely, my myoepithelial cells or basal cell population. And the blue might be um, basal cells or luminal cells or uh, something that has the characteristics of both. So I think I'm going to keep them separate for now based on the fact that this box plot looks like they have some different markers. My clustering separated them. And also, one other thing that's making me uh, want to keep them separate is that my Tisney plot has also indicated that these populations are separate to some extent. Not hugely separate because they're located in the same 2D region. But if you look here, the purple, which is this purple on the outside, is slight, in a slightly different location than the blue, which is located here. So if I go to the main screen, I can confirm this by unchecking the visibility of this population, going into gating, and then confirming that now it's grayed out because it's no longer visible. So I've got multiple levels of confirmation that there is a difference between these cells, clustering, Tisney, and box blot. Also from the image I saw that the TP63 was presented on this purple population and is absent uh, in the blue population. So let's go ahead and assign these some population names. We'll call this basal and uh, forgive the slight um, error here of my M key. And I just said basal luminal because there's characteristics of both in this population, but I, I don't have a precise name to give it for now. Okay, so that's how we can use the Tisney plot to identify uh, cell populations, as well as using uh, clustering and the box plot, as well as the image all together to identify populations with MAV. Let's go ahead and um, do this one more time. When we first started this presentation, I noted that uh, there was a population here in this area, in the stroma area where it's purple, where we saw CD31 and CD34. Okay, so let's go ahead if we can and identify this population in our populations table. So first, let's go to the image and activate CD31 and CD34. Okay. So I'll sort by C31 and C34 here in my gated populations. Now remember earlier I colored these uh, clusters by similarity and we see that they're both purple. Um, so of course we expect them um, to be similar based on their biomarker expression and the clustering color reflects that. Or the dendrogram really reflects that. Okay, we see the location of these, these cells is almost on the same group or the same place. So they're both identifying CD31 positive and uh, CD34 positive cells. Let's go ahead and toggle off the rest because all these dots are making it difficult to resolve the populations of interest. So I'm just right clicking it and saying toggle visibility and this should turn um, most of my populations if not all of them off. So only my gated populations stay on and any population I left at the end. One more gate 
Okay, so now I am seeing only the two clusters of interest. Let's go ahead and make them different colors, um, red and green. Hopefully that doesn't interfere with the red and green that we see that we've colored them by CD31, CD34. Okay, so we see that here we have both red and green identified almost in the same region. There's a few differences uh, in terms of the cell uh, population identification. You know, so four or five here are indicated as green and the rest are red. So it looks like the red and the green are both present on blood vessels and or vascular endothelial cells. And so I'd like to understand better why did the clustering algorithm pull these two populations apart? It looks like, based on the image and based on where I'm seeing these cells, it looks like they could be the same population. So I'm going to go to Analysis and Box Plot, and I see Population 2 is already selected. Let's make sure Population 13 is as well. Yes, it is. Okay. Again, all my markers to understand why clustering pulled them apart. Okay, there's some difference in C34 expression. Um, their median values are quite different, so that could be it. C31, not as big, but still some of a difference there. Definite difference. Uh, some difference in collagen. And a fairly large difference in SMA. So I'm guessing that um, what the difference was is some of these Vascular endothelial cells are overlapping with signal from cells expressing MMA, SMA, or they themselves are expressing SMA. Um, likely they're adjacent to cells expressing smooth muscle actin, and that's why they've been colored. Um, or that's why they're seen as expressing such a high level. So if we go to SMA in our marker list, we can see whether or not the cells are expressing it or if they're adjacent to cells expressing SMA. Okay, yeah, they themselves uh, might be expressing it. But still, the two populations look to be very similar. So I guess it depends on what region exactly you look at. But for the most part, I really think green and red look terribly similar. Um, and my box plot shows me that the green has a higher expression of SMA, but still has uh, and a little bit lower expression of CD31 and CD34, but not terribly different. If I go to my uh, gating here and I look at the green and the red, I see that they're both located in the same 2D location. So I have a number of indications that these populations might actually be the same. I know there's been some differences in SMA. It looks like some of these green cells might have the expression of SMA, but most of them are uh, over, appear to be overlapping on a similar population type. And so if I want to consolidate these two clusters into a single population, what I can do is highlight them, right click, and say combine. Now I can rename these. and I'm calling them vascular endothelial cells. Okay, so now we've identified um, how to combine a population uh, using clustering and using the image as well as TISNI. So we've seen two examples of how to use TISNI plots, box plots, um, and the image as well as the populations table and clustering in order to identify uh, different populations with MAV. Just very briefly here uh, to highlight a few other tools that we do have available to us, but I don't have a terribly uh, large amount of time to explain about today. I want to note these features. First, we do have a Voronoi plot, which allows us to see polygons constructed from cells nearest neighbors. This Voronoi plot is super useful for locating cells within the image because now the rest of the image appears gray, while only my cells of interest appear green, so the population checked. 
So that's super useful for finding cells within the image. And if I export the legend, then I'll have the letter and color associated with the cell type, which is the vascular endothelial cells. Now, just a quick note, if you have the Voronoi plot enabled, please disable the population over overlay so that you don't have your dots overlaid on the letter of the Voronoi population. Makes for easier viewing. So I also have the ability to plot heat maps of my populations so I can create a heat map showing the density of a population within the image. So that's available to me. So green is higher density and blue is low density with red being the highest density. So uh, blue to red in terms of increasing density of population. In addition to our uh, heat maps that allow us to see the uh, density of cells within the tissue, we also have the ability to compute spatial analysis. So if I turn on all my populations here and just exclude those gates uh, which identify most cells inside of the tissue, and I go to analysis and spatial analysis, choose my region, Min distance is 3. This is a camera that has 3 microns per pixel and I can't go below 1 pixel, so 3 is the min value. And here the max distance is whatever I set it to. Obviously it can't be below 3, but it can be whatever value I want. Um, and so here I'll just leave it to the default of 30. We see our spatial analysis is being calculated. So we have our log odds ratio, which is uh, generated for us. And blue indicates low likelihood of interaction, whereas red indicates a higher likelihood of interaction. And I can export this plot. As you see here, I have a lot of population, so it's not quite enough room to show all of them. Um, to export it, I would just click this button, which allows me to save these values as CSV. Okay, so if I want to change uh, the max distance, I can simply highlight this number and change it to 50, say compute. We see again the progress bar up here. All right, so now my new values are computed. I can see the log odds ratio or the number of interactions by clicking interaction count, and now I'm seeing the number of interactions. Or I can click um, circles plot and get a visual representation of my interactions between populations. So here, I have a large number of populations, so a lot of it is in gray. Um, but for those uh, populations where there's a sufficient population and su sufficient space, we can see the number of interactions between populations listed next to the ribbon. And the ribbon color and width it, uh, it indicates the number of interactions. So yellow is high and blue is low. And here we have 8,193 interactions between population 47 and population 24. And in each of these populations, we have the five most um, dominant markers or five markers with the highest median values uh, shown. And so uh, this plot allows us to see the number of interactions as shown by the value and also the color and width of the ribbon. We also have um, the biomarker uh, characteristics of these populations, so you can get a sense of uh, what these populations are that are interacting and what markers they express. Now I do have a lot of different markers show, populations rather shown here, so to reduce this I would just select fewer populations for my spatial analysis. Okay, um, that covers a lot of the features of MAV. There are other features that it's capable of. Um, there are other features built into MAV, such as uh, gating on populations. So for example, if I wanted to gate on my CDA T cells, I could say gate populations, um, and then I would be able to gate whatever markers I want to here. So you could put CD3 and then um, your marker of choice. Of course, we're going to have 
C3 and CD8 because I've just gated on CD8 T cells. And so we can see that's the entire green population. So now I can, uh, if I had it, I could gate on PD1 or whatever marker of my choosing. So I think I'm about at my limit of time today, um, but I would love to follow up with anyone if you have questions. So if there are any additional questions related to the uh, codex MAV analysis that we haven't had time to address today, please feel free to contact us at support at .com, and we will make some time, make some time for questions now uh, at the end of this webinar.